You're not allowed to explain anything by God. Therefore, you got to explain it by explosions and collisions. We examine a boatload of papers talking about astronomical collisions, and we interview a former atheist in the U.S. military space program. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy, answering your questions, and questioning your answers. Proudly brought to you by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, and now carried on the Christianima Network, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in Pirate Broadcasting, we took over the Starlight Music Theater so we could continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and give glory to the Creator while doing it. The Bible does not say, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same frontal lobotomy. No! We here at Genesis we believe God gave you a brain for a reason. Now remember, you can find us in cyberspace at wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, and you can subscribe to my YouTube channel and get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. There was a big impact in science this week, actually multiple impacts. Impacting stellar bodies are a favorite tool of astrophysicists employed to produce the incredible astronomical bodies we see throughout our universe. Now, this past week, there were four separate papers that came out relating to the impact formation theory of Earth's moon or other moons in our solar system. That's right. If you're not allowed to claim that God created the moon, as it clearly says in Genesis 1 and Psalms 8, then you must come up with a natural explanation for the moon. However, this is like trying to come up with a natural explanation for a concrete block. Uh, even if you came up with a plausible model as to how that concrete block was formed without any intervention, except natural processes, it doesn't mean your model is correct. In fact, your model would be incorrect because the concrete block had a creator. The favored explanation for the origin of Earth's moon has been the impact hypothesis. Of course, the impact hypothesis has also been the favored explanation for just about every mysterious feature we find in our solar system, so this should come as no surprise. In the present theory, a hypothesized planet about the size of Mars, which was even given the name Theia, slammed into Earth as it was just starting to cool into a big ball of rock. Now, in essence, this collision caused a debris field to orbit Earth, which got sucked together due to gravity and became the moon. Now, this collision is alleged to have happened 4.533 billion years ago, give or take a week. And how many weeks you get depends on who you ask. Now, there are so many problems with this hypothesis that it's difficult to number them, and it's difficult to know where to start. However, we'll focus on one problem to home in on our first story. Once the Apollo astronauts brought back rocks from the moon, we were able to analyze the rocks and compare them to Earth's rocks. Now, if the moon was the result of a collision between Earth and another planet, then the moon should be very different from Earth in its content, because the moon should have been composed mostly of rocks from Theia, not Earth. And it is highly improbable that the two planets were identical in composition. Now, much to the surprise of the naturalists, the composition of the moon and Earth were very similar. And so we come to the paper by Peniello et al. in Nature magazine this week. They studied the moon rocks, rocks here on Earth called tektites, and meteorites found in Antarctica that were assumed to have come from the moon. Now, what is a tektite? Well, a tektite is a mysterious kind of rock that we find all over the world, often in specific debris fields found on Earth. Now, these tektites were apparently molten, 
and flew through the air. Nobody really knows where they came from, but the current thinking is that these were formed when an asteroid impacted Earth. The impact melted the rock and threw it up high into the air, and the rock took on various shapes as it flew through the air and cooled into aerodynamic shapes or landed on the ground as a drop of cooling molten rock. Now, there is some debate that these tektites may actually be from the moon and not Earth. Now, as you can see, impacts can melt rock. Two planets colliding would be the ultimate asteroid impact and would produce a tremendous amount of heat, literally vaporizing many minerals and elements. Now, of course, some elements vaporize at higher temperatures than others. Iron has a much higher melting temperature than water, for example. Still, other minerals are lighter than others, and so some lighter vaporized elements would be lost out into space, while others would be sucked back into the debris field by the gravity of the debris field. Now, before we go on, many of you will need a crash course in nuclear physics. Once you've got the basics, I hear they're hiring in Iran and North Korea. So here goes. There are some elements which are identical chemically, but different atomically. Elements are composed of protons, electrons, and neutrons assembled into a balanced combination. The number of protons in the element determines where the element rests on the periodic table. But some elements can have varying numbers of neutrons. And so the element is unstable. The particles in the atom are not equal and balanced. And so in effect, the atom is out of balance and can throw off a particle or energy. This is called radiation. The element carbon has six protons and six neutrons. Now the electrons pretty much have a negligible weight. So we only add up the protons and neutrons to get an atomic weight of 12. However, sometimes you find a carbon atom which has an extra neutron or two. Thus, if you add up the protons and neutrons, you get an atomic weight of 14. There are six protons and eight neutrons. And so this element is called carbon-14, which no doubt you have all heard about. Carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14 are all called isotopes of the same element. Carbon-14 is actually physically heavier than carbon-13 and 12. If you had two identical blocks of carbon, but one was carbon-14 and the other carbon-12, the block of carbon-14 would actually be heavier than the carbon-12 block. Now, if you were to put on a whole pile of carbon dust in water and give it a good shake, the carbon-14 would settle out on the bottom and the lighter carbon-12 isotopes would wind up on top. Penny Yellow et al. looked at the rock samples and studied the ratios of zinc isotopes, working on the assumption that if the moon was formed by a gigantic collision and all of this heat vaporized the elements, then some of the lighter zinc isotopes would be lost, while some of the heavier zinc isotopes would have been kept by gravity. Now, similar studies of oxygen and titanium isotopes have also been conducted and found no difference between Earth and moon rocks. Peniello et al. looked at zinc because the zinc isotopes in volcanic lavas here on Earth are not changed, but it is expected that the extreme heat of an impact would cause the lighter isotopes to be lost. Now, this is probably the first study which actually did find a difference between the moon rocks and the rocks from Earth. The lighter zinc elements were depleted, but the heavier zinc elements were still there. So. Is this good evidence that the moon formed from a gigantic game of billiards? Hold that thought, because two more articles came out this past week, both of them in Science Magazine. The first article by Chuk and Stewart produced a computer model of the alleged interplanetary collision with a spin. They assumed the Earth was revolving once every two to two and a half hours. Now, most of the planetary collision models had a problem with the collision causing the Earth and Moon system to spin too fast. Chuck and Stewart ignored all speed limit signs and went for broke, assuming a faster spinning planet. The collision would allegedly mix the debris from both planets so thoroughly 
that it would explain the similar isotopic composition between the Earth and Moon. Then they just got to worry about how on Earth to slow Earth down to its present 24-hour rotation. Previous models had shown that any way they tried to slow down really fast rotation heated up the Earth and the Moon. So, how'd Chuke and Stewart do it? Well, it wasn't on Earth. It was with what they called evection resonance, where the Moon and Earth, joined together by gravity, held their positions relative to each other, but spread out and at a 90 degree angle to the Sun. And thus, many thousands of years of interacting with the Sun's gravity slowed down the rotation of the Earth. A second paper in the same issue of Science magazine took the exact opposite route, <laughs> assuming a much smaller original Earth, a much larger impacting planet, and a slow impact speed. Robin Kennop assumed that the two original planets were of close to equal size, and thus the present Earth and Moon are a combination of the material from both planets, hence the isotope similarities between the two. Now, of course, Canop's model left the Earth and Moon spinning far too fast, so she referred to Chuuk and Stewart's model for help in slowing down the system. Not to be outdone, Space.com carried an article about a soon-to-be-released paper by Osfaug and Rufer claiming that many of Saturn's moons were the result of collisions between other astronomical bodies that came near Saturn. These collisions produced the moon Titan, and the debris scattered from the collision produced other small moons around Saturn, like Minas, Enceladus, Tethys, Dion, Rhea, and Iapetus. Now that we've gone into depth introducing the papers this week, let me please introduce you to my special guest this week. Spike Becerra is a former atheist who worked as an engineer in the United States military space program. Spike wound up becoming a born-again Christian and a young Earth creationist. He developed and produced the incredible video series What You Aren't Being Told About Astronomy to document what he learned and the scientific reasons he rejected the evolutionary paradigm and embrace the biblical account of creation. He joins me by telephone from his home in Washington State. Welcome to the program, Spike. Thanks, Ian. Happy to be here. Okay, so you heard the reports this week, uh, four of them, and I'm going to home in on several points to be made with each of the models. Let's start with Moynier's study of the zinc isotopes. Uh, now, the Live Science article pointed out uh, the very first thing that came to my mind when I read Moynier's article, and that was water. Uh, we find water on the moon. That was the whole point of NASA's L-Cross project, where they, they launched a rocket into the moon to kick up debris and examine the debris for water. Now, unfortunately, they didn't start an interplanetary war. Uh, but this brings up the question, how on Earth could zinc have evaporated, been evaporated by this alleged interplanetary collision, but water wasn't? I mean, I, I know this is something you discussed in your past newsletters, uh, but Live Science, actually Live Science quoted Mornier as saying, the results show that all this water they found on the face of the moon is secondary water. Uh, what's, what's your take on this? Well, the water found on the face of the moon, the, the surface water is beside the point. Uh, several reports have talked about the surface water, but that's sort of a weird combination of a straw man and a red herring. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> so it's sort of like a, a red straw man herring. Or something like that, something yeah. Like, okay, I like it. I like it. Okay. Because <laughs> wa water on the surface could have been brought to the moon by comets and meteorites after it formed. Now, everybody understands that. So surface water doesn't tell us anything about what was happening on the moon during the time it formed. So the real question is whether or not there's water inside the moon, not, not on the surface. Okay. And if the giant impact model were true, there wouldn't be any water in the moon's interior because it all would have been vaporized during the collision and the post-impact heating. And indeed, the, the data did seem to support this for a while. The Apollo astronauts actually brought back several hundred pounds of uh, rocks and soil samples with them. And when the samples were first analyzed back in the 70s, they were found to be fairly dry. So everybody figured that that meant that the moon doesn't have significant water. And back in 2008, a few years ago now, they published their results. It turns out the lunar samples do have water. The samples okay. have about 10 times as much water as, as was previously thought. And here's the important part in all this, that the samples are made of volcanic glasses. So that means they came from inside the moon during a volcanic eruption. Ah. So, this me so this means there's water inside of the moon. And that's where the giant impact model says there can't be any. 
But uh, there was a problem with that first study. That study was uh, done on basalt, and the basalt would have lost some of its water because of degassing during the eruption. So it was clear that there used to be even more water than they were able to find in the analysis in 2008, but they couldn't tell how much. So they went back again, and this time they looked for melt inclusions in the volcanic glass. Now a melt inclusion is a little tiny sample of magma that gets trapped inside crystals that form inside the glass before the eruption occurs. Sure enough, there's water trapped inside the melt inclusions. In fact, they found there's up to 100 times as much water there as the previous study had found. Okay, that's, so that's that, a lot. <laughs> yes. So this creates a serious problem for the whole giant impact theory now, because that theory says that all water would have been vaporized during the collision. So that means that the moon can't have any today, at least not on the inside. Again, there may be on the surface, but that's not the point. The point is there shouldn't be any on the inside, and that's where the volcanic glass came from. So now we know that the moon's interior does contain water, and actually it's a, comparable to the level of water inside the Earth's mantle. Wow. And they actually found some other volatile elements inside the samples too, but water is really the biggest deal in all of this. It certainly would be. I mean, uh, that's uh, the, the same amount of water in the Earth's mantle. I mean, Earth's mantle has a lot of water in it. Yes. Uh, and, I mean, we're talking about water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, while zinc uh, boils at, what, 900, 907 Celsius, which is, uh, what, a, a little over 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit for you Amer Americans there. So, I mean, <laughs> it's really hot. <laughs> So it, it seems the evolutionists have to believe that the collision produced temperatures above 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit, which was hot enough to boil away much of the zinc. But it wasn't hot enough to boil away the water. It, so that, exactly. It, this, exactly. The whole thing doesn't make sense. Right. Okay. And, and none of these papers published about uh, the, the new discoveries, or sorry, no, none of the papers published about the new discoveries are, are talking about this. They're not talking about the water. They'll right. just say we found new theoretical ways that the moon could have formed in a giant impact without talking about the physical evidence that says it didn't happen. Right. And the theoretical part of this has a lot of uncertainty anyway. And the media reports aren't talking about that either. Uh, okay, well, let, let's talk about that for a moment then. Well, uh, the model is heavily dependent on tidal effects to move the moon away from the Earth after it supposedly formed. It also needs tides to slow down the Earth's spin. Again, as I said, the model says the the Earth used to be spinning 10 times as fast as it is right now. But when you calculate tidal effects, which is what this model is based on, you need to know how much energy is dissipated in the planet that you're dealing with. Uh, this is affected by things like the planet structure and things like that. Now in tidal equations, when you're doing these calculations, uh, all of these factors are combined into something called the quality factor, and it's right. represented by the letter Q. Right. Now Q represents how much energy is dissipated within the bodies the planetary bodies, as the tidal effects try to distort them. Now, in the new impact model here, they used a range of values for Q, but it turns out the numbers aren't right. For the, the Q of the moon, they used several values from 48 to 117. Right. But we know what the real value is for the moon's Q. It's only 27. Now, for the Earth, they used, <laughs> for a Q number, 48 and 96. And at one point in the paper, they even talked about the Q for the Earth being as high as 10,000. But again, we know what the real value is for the Earth. It's only 12. So I guess, I mean, the overall point is, over and over again, we see that the model doesn't match the actual physical evidence that we see today. And this is actually a common problem with these sorts of models in astronomy, because to make the models, evolutionists are speculating that maybe all these values used to be different in the past. Right. But science is based on observations, and the past is unobservable. All we can observe is the present, and in the present, the Earth-Moon system doesn't match the model. Right. Okay. So now uh, we, we were talking about tides. Um, t they also tell us something about, the tides do, tell us something about whether or not the Earth-Moon system can be billions of years old. Why don't you tell us about that? On Earth, we experience the tides as the ocean rising and falling, but that's not really what's happening. What's happening is that the Earth rotates underneath the tidal bulges. And as you stand on one spot of the Earth, your location rotates into a bulge and then back out of it. Um, uh, the, the rotation of the Earth isn't shown on this video here, so the viewers will have to imagine how that works, but hopefully that's clear. Now, as the Earth spins underneath the tidal bulges, it actually drags the bulges forward slightly, because there's a little bit of friction there between the, the uh, ocean floor and the water. So the bulge that faces the moon doesn't line up with the moon exactly. It's actually offset by a little bit. Now, we're talking about a, a large mass of ocean water here. That 
exerts a gravitational pull of its own that's slightly offset from the Earth's gravitational pull. So that pulls the moon slightly sideways, which accelerates the moon in its orbit. And the effect of that is that when you accelerate something in an orbit, it moves further away. So the, this means the moon is actually moving away from the Earth by a small distance each year. Right. Now we know this is happening and we know how much. We've actually been measuring this effect very precisely with lasers for a, a couple decades now. Mm -hmm. So, if you think about this, if the moon moves farther away each year, that means it used to be closer in the past. So if you do the math, it turns out that the moon would have been touching the Earth only 1.6 billion years ago. Now I say only. That's I mean that's a long time. <laughs> yes. I'm not I'm not saying that the Earth Moon system is 1.6 billion years old. That's the maximum age for the system. It's not mm -hmm. the minimum age. Now I've come to believe that the Earth Moon system is less than 10,000 years old, and what we see is quite consistent with that. But it's very inconsistent with the long age view, which needs the Earth Moon system to be four billion years old, mm -hmm. two and a half billion years older than it can be according to what we see going on today. Okay, well, we got to cut out of here. Uh, you can order Spike's excellent video series, the series that the anti-creationists tried to boycott. <laughs> that was when I knew Spike had hit a home run, when the response was systematically dodging Spike's points. Uh, I knew he was onto something. Spike goes into a lot more details in what he discussed here in those videos. Uh, you can also sign up for his ever-informative newsletter, uh, all at his website, creationastronomy.com. Uh, this interview was also edited for brevity, and you can catch the entire interview at genesisweek.com. Thanks so much for joining me here today, Spike. Thank you, Ian. Happy to be here. And we'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. What does the Bible say about aliens? Is there life on other planets? What can science tell us about the possibility of aliens? Ian Juby gives answers to these and many more questions in this fascinating and highly disturbing subject. Looking analytically at the subject, complete with the testimonies of people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. The answers will probably surprise you. In this one and a half hour lecture, Ian shows that the alleged aliens are a problem and that Jesus is the solution. Order online today at Ian's Bookstore. Funny, Fast and Furious. Ian's Crevo rants cover a multitude of topics in an easy to understand comical way. Complicated subjects that normally make your brain hurt, hurt a lot less when Ian explains them while wearing his anti-government mind reading equipment. Have questions about carbon-14 dating, natural selection, thermodynamics, or what on earth is he doing there? Three volumes of rants on DVD. Take your pick for $15 each plus shipping and handling or order all three as a package and save yourself 10 bucks. Order online today at Ian's Bookstore. for me? Ah! Yep, that's the one. East Vietnamese jumping spider. The venom is so strong that one bite can kill any child and 95% of adults. The surviving 5% typically slip into a coma for three to six months, only to wake up with permanent paralysis. Hmm. Thanks to everyone who wrote in, keep them coming. Uh, Answers Questions made a valid point in regards to last week's show about the discussion of reproduction. ERVs also protect the embryo from the mother's immune system, but evolutionists still call them junk DNA. Indeed, and ERVs are an important subject, an evidence claimed by many evolutionists to be evidence of evolution. We will discuss this in a future program, the significance of ERVs and how they do not support evolution. In response to a comment on YouTube made by Piper JK about the punctuated equilibrium model I discussed briefly last week, Radar Binder wrote in, Piper JK is just another in a long line of Darwinists who will claim someone unnamed at some unknown place still has some plausible explanation for the preposterous statements of Darwinism, but these guys go away after throwing tomatoes. Punctuated equilibrium is just a kind of fudge factor. You see, evolution happens too fast to leave transitional forms behind, but it is too slow to observe. One would think, as a scientist, that therefore it just doesn't happen at all. Punctuated equilibrium is just mythology. 
Ian, could you direct me to the information about a dinosaur bone that had carbon in it? Was it a fossil? Were parts of it still organic bone? If a creationist uses carbon-14 dating, is it considered accurate? Certainly. A significant point to be made here is that when we find dinosaur bones, the bone is still there. It's coated with rock and is permeated by rock, but the bone is still there. Now, there was actually hundreds of papers on carbon-14 carbon found in samples where they shouldn't be. In the Rate 2 book on page 596 and 597, there are over 100 examples cited. Radiocarbon has also been found in carbon dioxide wells, natural gas wells, coal seams, crude oil wells, and of course, dinosaur and mammoth bones, as well as wood fragments found in Cretaceous layers, and even diamonds. Now, I'm not saying carbon-14 dating is accurate, I am saying that if it is right, we creationists might be out on our age by a factor of perhaps 10, whereas the naturalistic deep time view would be out by a factor of 900,000. Great job, Ian. Thanks for the ever more scientific ammunition for the pro-life view on the ever so touchy issue of abortion. I will make it a point to share this video with the pro-life Facebook groups I'm involved with. Keep up the great work and I look forward to next week's Genesis Week episode. I'm not sure I understood the gravity well explanation. If the universe does have an edge and center, then the edge is moving near the speed of light, which would mean that time there is at least sluggish as it is here. This theory would also mean that light is actually more than a million times slower than what we perceive it to be. Since light isn't fast, we're just that slow. It presents some very thought-provoking implications. Thank you for addressing my question, though. Well, I did try to explain this in very, very brief form, <laughs> and one of my trusted researchers pointed out that Humphreys had updated his model quite a bit. Uh, you can read more about it here. Okay, we're going to call that a wrap. I'm your host, Ian Juby, hoping you'll join me again next Genesis Week. Remember, you can send in your comments and questions in a number of ways. Just remember that by submitting your comments, you are giving us permission to use them on the show. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com, or you can, like, follow us on Twitter or something, I don't know. Or even send us a tweet at Genesis Week, or you can go to our YouTube channel at genesisweek.com, find the appropriate show, and post a comment there. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're there to keep up to date on the bonus videos. This show will be uploaded the Friday after airing, and just remember that comments on YouTube are moderated and require approval. Remember those words of warning and comfort from our Savior and Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. See you later. We need your support to help keep this program on the air. You can help by making a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K2P4. You can also sign up for Ian's newsletter detailing current research and news items at ianjuby.org. Thank <laughs> you.